Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Now, sometimes when long-held beliefs or opinions that we might have are shattered, it can be kind of difficult for us to wrap our minds around. Um, And so I'm, I'm about to do that probably for some of us. I hate to break it to you guys, But these wise men that we read about every year, they were not that wise, okay? They were not that wise. And if you would like me to elaborate on this, I think that, you know, the burden of proof, I guess, is on me this morning, um, I'd be happy to. So, first of all, these wise men, let's, let's just walk through this. They show up to the current king of the Jews, King Herod, reigning in Jerusalem, and they tell Herod that the one who is going to succeed him, take his place, has been born. Okay? How do you think this made King Herod feel? Well, the text tells us that Herod was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. I think the the modern day way to translate that sentence would be, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, okay? If King Herod ain't happy, ain't nobody happy there in Jerusalem because King Herod got angry, he got scared, he feared for his position, and all Jerusalem is troubled along with him. There's a lot of unrest there in that city. And so Herod hatches a plan. He tells the wise men, oh, guys, as soon as you locate this new king, you let me know exactly where he is so that I can go and worship him myself. And you know what? The wise men were going to do it. The wise men were going to, they were like, yeah, sounds like a plan, King Herod. We'll go find him. We'll come back and we'll, we'll give you, we'll, we'll draw you a map and everything. It's going to be great. Um, it's, it was only by the intervention of the angel in the dream after they had seen Jesus that they decided, you know, oh, maybe we shouldn't lead King Herod to this child Um, Maybe he has evil designs. I mean, right, it was an evil, nefarious plan. King Herod wanted to get rid of another threat to his throne. Actually, King Herod had already murdered several of his family members. You know, he was was all about maintaining his power. Uh, So, if it were not for the angel's intervention, the wise men would would have led King Herod right to the new king. Wise men, I think not. Um, as long as we're piling on these guys, let me, let me take a couple more shots. Um, you know, how hard is it to, you know, to follow a big star up in the sky? Am I right? I don't think you have to have an astronomy degree to do that. I think I could probably do that. And they didn't give the most practical gifts to a toddler, right? If we had, if, if we had received frankincense and myrrh uh, for our kids, I would have... I would have made them politely say thank you, but I would have kind of side-eyed the person who, you know, this is going to make a mess in our house. It's going to be very smelly. Um, So wise men, wise men. And you know what? That translation, you know, we have in some biblical translations, it is translated as wise men. That's not even the most accurate way to translate it, I don't believe. What, what What is another way to translate that that whatever word that is that gets translated as wise men. Do you guys know, what's another thing that we call these, these dudes? I, I heard someone say magi. That is correct, magi. I think magi is a better word to use. And when you hear the word magi, it's one letter off from another word that we kind of commonly use in the English language. And... Um, It's not something that we really talk about very much in a favorable light in a religious setting, right? Can you guys think of a word? Add one letter to the word magi, and what what might you get? Magic, right? Okay, so these, these magi, 
You know, the wisdom that they had was not in anything positive. They were like wise in, shall we say, the dark arts, you know, black magic, sorcery, things like that. They were not wise in the things of God. They were wise in things that are of the world, contrary to God. And this word magi pops up at least a couple other times in the scriptures, and it is never in a positive sense. Kind of an obscure uh, reference, but in Acts chapter 13, Paul encounters a guy who is described as, it's, it's the same word that is used for magi, um, a guy named Bar-Jesus. And the text tells us that he was a false prophet. He's like a magician. And Paul does not hold back against this guy. He denounces him in public, and then he blinds him. Okay? There's, there's one other example of magi in the Bible. There's another one, though, and this one might be a little bit more familiar, from Daniel chapter 2. You guys remember King Nebuchadnezzar? He had a dream, and he was asking for, he was begging anyone in his employ to tell him what the dream meant, and he had these people in his court that were, that were called magi, and they were like in the group of court sorcerers and magicians, and he tasked them with trying to interpret what the dream was. Uh, and they couldn't do it. Daniel was able to do it with the help of God, God revealing what the dream was. Um, so, we have to put ourselves in the, in the shoes of original readers of Matthew's gospel, okay? Imagine that Matthew's gospel back in the, the first century is hot off the press, and you're reading along, and you're, you're a Jew, maybe you know, you've, you've converted to Christianity, whatever. Um, you would have been predisposed to think that the Magi were going to be the bad guys in the story. You would have thought, these guys are going to be the villains, they're like sorcerers. They're not wise in the things of God. They're wise in things contrary to God. But we know, I mean, we just read through the whole Bible, right? We know that God loves to make twists in the stories. He loves to make the unexpected people the heroes. You would hope that the actual king of the Jews, King Herod, would be like the good guy in this story, and the Magi, would, you kind of expect them to be the villains, but it gets flipped around because God delights in revealing himself and his son to the people that are more unlikely. And that's what we see here. And so this story of the Magi from Matthew chapter 2 teaches us that even wise guys can be saved. When was the last time you were called a wise guy? Did you take it as a compliment? Because I hate to break it to you, it probably wasn't. You know, if somebody says, oh, you're a wise guy, eh? You know, they're, they're not really giving you a, a compliment. They're kind of, you know, it's, it's sarcasm. There's a big difference between being wise according to the world's standards and being wise according to God's standards. You know, wise guys according to the world's standards are not, they're not wise in the ways of God. They're, they're wise in many things, perhaps, and that wisdom of the world sometimes makes us become very proud and very comfortable, and we trust in all of this wealth of information and knowledge and wisdom that we have acquired but it is far from the things of God. And now, some of, this, some of these things are not like inherently wrong, but if we think that we've acquired all of the wisdom that we need and we have not found the wisdom of God yet, we've really got nothing. We've got nothing to show for our efforts. Now, Paul discusses this in this reading that we had just earlier from 1 Corinthians. Paul says, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. You know, it's just God flips things upside down. 
He goes on to say, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The wisdom of the world is foolishness, according to God, and God's foolish message centered in his son Jesus is actually wisdom, true wisdom. Now, at some point, people will, even, even wise guys will realize that their wisdom will not save them. And in fact, it's even the opposite. It's, it's even worse, you know. Not only is it just kind of worthless, it is actually, um, if, that, if, that is, if the world's wisdom is what you're holding on to, it will actively destroy you. It will lead, not to salvation, but to death, in fact. Now, the, the Magi were probably very learned men in a number of things, but until God intervened in their lives and revealed his own truth and his own wisdom, they were lost. You know, some of us, well, probably every one of us gathered here today is wise in something, you know, or maybe multiple somethings. But unless we have the wisdom of God, it doesn't really matter a whole, a whole lot. Now, in the, in the Lutheran church, we have this book called The Small Catechism. And even just me saying it probably makes some of you flash back to your confirmation days where you had to memorize everything and you're getting nervous even just sitting there thinking about that. But it, it is a beautiful book. And it lays out the, the Lutheran theology and it goes through things like the Ten Commandments and the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, the sacraments. And it tells what Lutherans believe, and then it tells why it goes to the Bible and just lifts off all of these scripture references. It's the beauty of the book. It's like, we're not just making stuff up out of thin air. We're, we're, everything we believe, teach, and confess comes from the Word of God. And the, the one section that I, I love, I mean, I love it all. I, well, I mean, obviously, I'm a Lutheran pastor, but, um, but I, I really, really love the Apostles' Creed. And the third article of the Creed talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. And it talks about how, how people become wise unto salvation. Here's how it works. This is what it says. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But, here comes the good news. The Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified, and kept me in the true faith. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. If it's, if it's up to us, no chance, not a prayer. But when it's up to God to send his Holy Spirit and lead us to Jesus, now we've got something. This is the way that it works. There is just simply no becoming wise in the things of God on our own. No chance. And, and this is a major theme that comes up in the Bible. Again and again, God reinforces this fact that he, uh, he alone can reveal Jesus to us. And, you know, we're, we're reading about, uh, we're here in Matthew's Gospel this morning for this Epiphany Gospel. We'll stay, we'll, I'm going to show you guys two other examples from Matthew's Gospel where Jesus is explicitly teaching the same thing. Now, in Matthew chapter 11, he's just laid out, um, kind of, you know, he's, he's kind of bemoaned the fact that people misunderstand who he is. They don't get why he came what his identity is, what he's doing here. And then he says this prayer in front of everybody. He says, um, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Little, little children like us, who on our own would never find true wisdom. But, God, but it pleases God to reveal it to us. And then another example 
the famous, you know, Jesus is, is pulling the disciples, finding, you know, hey, what are people saying about me? And then, then he turns around and he says, well, well, what do you guys say about me? And Peter gets the answer right. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he stands there and waits for his gold star. He just knows he's going to get rewarded. Pat on the back, handshake, something. Um, Jesus does pronounce a blessing upon him, but he also kind of puts him in his place, reminds him how he came to know this. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And this is the only way that it works. Nobody, nobody can come to the knowledge and saving faith in Jesus Christ unless it is revealed by God. Nobody can't happen. And it's good news. Because if it's up to God, then really anybody can be saved. This gives us great hope. This gives us encouragement because it means that if it's up to God, anybody can be saved. Even wise guys. Even wise guys can be saved. The Magi, against all odds... They seem like they're going to be villains as you turn to Matthew chapter 2. And they are the good guys because God has revealed Jesus to them. They follow the star. They go and worship the newborn king. And you can bet they bring this wisdom from God back to their land. Their lives are forever changed because of the divine revelation that God gives to them. And that's what this celebration of the epiphany is that God is revealing himself to all people, not just a select group of people, not just people who have risen to some level of earthly wisdom and now they get to acquire this, this important thing. No, he's revealing it to everyone, not just to the Jews, but to Gentiles, to the whole world. And so we rejoice that God revealed Jesus to the Magi. We, we rejoice that he reveals Jesus to the likes of us. And we rejoice that he continues to reveal Jesus to other people. Maybe people that we are sharing Jesus. Maybe people that we are praying will come to know Jesus, that we're praying for every day. Anybody can be saved when it's up to God. So rejoice this epiphany in that, in that fact and pray that God will, will even invite us to participate in pointing other people to Jesus. In his name, amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all of our human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.